Noswetha a chroeso i sgwrs Carl Hopkin a my fam yr artist Elizabeth Hopkin. Good evening and welcome to a talk about the paintings of time of Elizabeth Hopkin by her daughter, Carol. It was um, wonderful to meet Betty Hopkin in 2014 as a trustee of the Joseph Herman Art Foundation Cymru. I recorded an oral history with Betty at her home and as part of the Mining Joseph Herman project for Tate Britain at the time. Please now I may I introduce fellow Joseph Herman Art Foundation Cymru trustee, Carol Hopkin, to begin her talk. Can I just say, if you have any questions, please leave in the chat box below, and I'll read these out at the end of the talk. Diolch, Carol. Diolch, Catherine, and thank you to all the uh, trustees of the Foundation for asking me to do this talk on uh, Elizabeth Hopkin, known professionally, but known as Betty uh, by friends and family all her life. She was named actually Mary Elizabeth Jane Morgan after two grandmothers and a great grandmother. And uh, born in 1919. Slides aren't moving, I'm afraid. This will work. Yes, sorry. Luddite that I am. Um, Yes, here she is on the beach in Caswell with her mother, Blodwen, aged about two here. Um, her date of birth changed from 1919 to 1920 when she met my father, who was born in 1920, and it seemed not the thing to do to be uh, older than your husband. This, uh, they were back on holiday here because Slo, her father, who was a photographer and teacher, um, was head of an arts and crafts school in Oxford at the time. And this was a holiday they spent back in Astragunlas in the Swansea Valley and Gower. This is... Uh, Betty at Kensington Gardens. There weren't many little Welsh Valley girls who got to Kensington Gardens at those times, uh, but Slo, being a teacher, um, could afford a car, so there was a lot of traveling. He had been a miner from 19, from the age of 14 to 17, yes. Um, but after two very serious accidents, parents insisted that he try for a university um, admission and he got into Exeter University so and qualified as a teacher. Um, the car meant uh, a great deal uh, to help the family and friends also um, travel about. This is one of the first that Betty did. Um, it shows the row of cottages called Tear Wine, which means the houses of the meadow or the moor, and it was where Claire was born. The land was, uh, Tear Wine, was owned by Claire's mother's family, the Lewises, and they also owned the Jeffreys Arms in Astragunlas, a public house. That's it on the right hand side. Behind the public house were about eight acres of land where they kept cows and uh, um, a pig and a pony and lots of poultry. Opposite Tirwa, um, Jeffrey's Arms is Cambrian Terrace. This is also known as Runaway Terrace. Um, the little children thought it was um, because the houses seemed to run all the way up to the sky up Brecon Road, but the older children knew it was probably because a lot of the um, residents ran away when the rent man came. This is uh, one of her first watercolours and it shows Slough 
making his way down to the bridge over the river in Kungir, um with Blodwen waited, waiting there. So it was, <clears throat> it was called the appointment and that sold in New York um, a few years later. There's always a little boy peeping out there, seeing what's going on. This is an idyllic view of Tierwine, um, the eight acre plot behind the house of Sunny Hill, where the family lived. And um, it is idyllic, but in the back, which I can't see, but I hope you can, um, there are coal tips. So it's always a reminder that the industry was always there. Uh, it's the children playing here, the cousins. Because when Betty, being an only child, came back from Oxford, she met 21 first cousins. Uh, because, well, her parents were um, both from a family of nine siblings each. So there were always a lot of children around. This is uh, Betty and one of her favourite cousins, my uncle Yori, who went on to do amazing things in the Second World War uh, and being awarded for his bravery. They're down in Langland, which is on the Gower coast. This is uh, basically what life was like um, in Tierwine for the children and friends. It's a swing that Cleo had put over the little stream, the Gurlai stream, which ran at the side of the colliery. So quite idyllic. When the children got older, they would uh, spend Sunday afternoons when the miners were sleeping walking around the colliery feeder, uh, definitely not drinking water. It was quite deep and quite a dangerous thing to do. And uh, it was quite safe until somebody screamed crocodile. And then their screams would bring the colliery manager running and um, telling them to get off the land or prosecutions would occur, not knowing of course what that meant. Um, the children will be back the next Sunday, <clears throat> risking life and limb. <clears throat> this is um, Clare's Ford, little Ford car, and it did allow them to get out into the hills and the Brecon Beacons, um, probably a carload of friends and family as well. Betty learned to draw quite early in her life. Um, and I think being photographed so often as he was um, a professional photographer, gave her that sense of composition. This is um, her grandmother, Jane, who was a quilter and um, quite well known nationally in the Eisteddfods winning prizes, but also internationally um, because two of her quilts were uh, taken to be displayed at the Paris exhibition and were later bought by the Louvre. So they hung there in the Louvre gallery in Paris. She's looking out on Cambrian Terrace, so keeping an eye on everything that's going on as well. The table was probably made for her. Uh, she, she quilted for royalty, uh, Duchess of Norfolk, the Countess of Hardwick, and also did um, quite a magnificent quilt for Earl Baden-Powell and Lady Baden-Powell. They were friends of her son, Ted, Clow's brother, known locally as Skip Morgan, and he was scoutmaster of the Swansea Valley Brigade. Their house, Sunny Hill, next to the Jeffreys Arms, um, was a place where all the cousins could meet uh, and play. Although on Sundays, this is called Collier Sunday, it's an oil again, was definitely silence in the afternoon after the large lunch because of the men having to catch up with their sleep. 
the colliers were working 10 hours a day. And early when Llew was a collier, there would be a walk of about three miles to the mine before the 10 hour shift and a walk back uh, six days a week for which they were given one pound, 10 shillings, I think weekly then. It did rise to two pounds, two in the thirties. The rest of the family, the men are upstairs in the beds, but space was short. So put your head down on the table and uh, try and get some rest was the order of the day. This is the Whitson Parade. Um, from Sardis Chapel in Ostrogunnus. And this um, parade would go around the village with the banners uh, and the band following as well, and go on a tour of the village and come back to the chapel. The ladies there are putting tea out, it was wonderful tea spread out in the garden. And I don't know if you can just see it, but there's a little boy climbing over the wall there um, to steal the sandwiches. That was one of the Pike boys and they lived in that house there, which was uh, also a vegetable and fruit shop. Reportedly, uh, well, I don't know whether, <laughs> it was always my mother said, there were 26 Pike children. Uh, I don't know how many mothers there were, but 26 was the number generally known. This is the, I still vote in 1954 in Astragunlas, and this is my mother's memory of it. We're in the Gorseth Circle. Uh, in the distance, you can just see College Row, uh, one of the little streets in Astragunlas. This is another annual event. Um, not very happy for the pig. It was the annual pig killing, which would give the family food for many, many months to come and also um, a share of faggots made from the liver with the addition of herbs and onions and apples. And they'd be shared with the uh, neighbors and also the very rich gravy. The children would run away, of course, when the deed was done by Mr. Lowe there in the middle, the butcher in his apron and top hat. Uh, but they'd come back as soon as the poor pig was killed and there'd be a deathly silence. On the right is uh, my uncles, Uncle Tom, Uncle Ted and Uncle Di in army and navy uniforms and my grandfather fell to the right uh, not in uniform he was a conscientious objector in the first world war and won his case school um was uh generally happy except for the headmaster who was a bit of a, a bit of a tyrant uh, school was first Penrose Junior School, and then this, I think, is definitely, because they're all in school uniform, was the Meisterderen County Grammar School, uh, which Betty got into after passing the scholarship. The uh, girls were told to go out by Miss Pugh, the botany mistress to go out into nature the best way to learn about it was to go out into nature and experience it so off they went to the woods and what they experienced was um, that blonde from who worked in Lipton's grocery um, with her canoodling with her latest bow they made notes and I think a few drawings and went back to Miss Pugh, who wasn't at all amused, of course, and issued the girls with a hundred lines each. Another one of the school group of um, paintings. And this is probably what uh, most of us had in school. There was always one 
school cert, it's called. So the most provocative girl in their year, knowingly enjoying the approval of the boys below. Uh, she's supposed to be watching the cricket match in the back. Um, years later, apparently, while she was living in London, she appeared in the, lo in the uh, newspaper as being involved in a nightclub brawl. And everybody agreed, of course, uh, it had been inevitable. This is called No Date Tonight. Um, probably what we've all felt at some time or other. Um, looking forward to nothing but a lonely weekend, perhaps. Betty's style changed um, quite a bit, as most artists do, obviously, um, over the years. This is called tonging. Now, that might be um, a strange word for a lot of uh, people, but uh, the tongs are metal, metal tongs put into deep into the flame of the fire tested on newspaper so that it wouldn't burn your hair away. And uh, I wonder the little girl on the left, I think that's Esme and Irene in the middle. Um, but it was only the way, the only way actually to get your Marcel waves as the um, movie stars had. The cinema was a huge uh, influence, probably the biggest influence on the community. Um, especially the youngsters. The cinema there, the Astoria, opened in 1919. And this is one of the, yes, if not the first, quite um, an early painting that sold quickly. The detail in here is quite extraordinary. On the left, there's a little car on the road, and that would be my grandfather's car. Claire was going into the house, which is our house there, called Merton, after Merton College in Oxford, which they lived um, near to in the 20s. Rosie Pike, uh, here with a horse and cart, is speeding down the hill with an empty cart, having sold all the fruit and veg and all the crowd are shouting, go on Tom Mix. Uh, my grandmother's in the front opening her umbrella and my mother there with Uncle Yori to join the queue. The queue would go right up to the Jeffrey's arms. It was uh, twice nightly and of course a change of films on Thursday. Um, so it's, it was a huge, huge draw. In the back, um, center back, there's a little red, it was Cowlings, the Abdasha. Right next to that was the opening to the um, Miners Welfare Hall, which opened in 1935. So that, um, yeah, 1935, that's open, that's right. This is way before that, obviously. Uh, and it's where the Joseph Herman Foundation now have their home. This is called, this is an oil, and it's called wait, uh, Man Waiting for Her, uh, he's waiting for her. And uh, a typical um, outside the cinema view, and she's waiting for him. This is called Flirt in the Queue. I don't think she's very pleased to be flirted with. This was um, one of the favorites of Eric Lister, the portal gallery that my mother joined in the 1970s. It's called Birth of a Nation, uh, coming out of the cinema with the tips in the back 
Well, they weren't there. There was just a signature that it had to go in. And um, the baby is coming out. Eric Lister, head of the portal, called it too much kissing in the back row. But um, there was a lot of, uh, well, there, there was such innocence because <clears throat> when my mother was first kissed up in the park, in Astrid Park, when she was 16, um, absolute terror and raced home convinced that she was pregnant. It was probably uh, a lot to do with the, the films they saw. You'd see a sequence where um, the heroine and the hero kissed and the next sequence of the film, they'd be pushing a pram. So perhaps the connection was there. This is the, the smokers. And I think this is influenced by an event that happened um, in well, while she was in school, actually, that uh, two boys having an illicit smoke in the back of the uh, back of the school near the dustbins found carbon copies of all the school questions that were coming up in the terminal exams. And the word got round and everyone knew that a representative from each class had to be sent up to Cledlin Jones's house. Cledlin was on the table holding the carbon copy up to the light and reading out form three algebra. And um, the rep would step forward, take down the questions. Uh, and Betty, even though her father was a teacher, I'm afraid she joined the parade as well. If they'd had sense, of course, they'd have made a few mistakes. Um, but none of them did. All they were interested in getting to a Slavera fair on the Saturday night. Um, it was twice nightly, the fair, and uh, twice annually, I mean, and uh, that's all they had their focus on. Um, of course, the marks were so astonishing. I think Betty went from 29 in algebra to something like 82. Um, and so the headmaster and the teachers smelt a rat, or rather a pig, because he got up in assembly and said, I've heard of four-legged pigs, but I've never heard of two-legged pigs scavenging around dustbins. And uh, so a reset was arranged quickly and marks were as usual way down and no fair because not only did they have their heads down over the weekend uh, swatting up for the Monday but uh, they were a total disgrace I think my father's grammar school down the valley in Ponte Dawa heard about it shampoo night that was all important um, Quite complicated. This is Betty getting ready for uh, the school dance in 1936. Bought light colored Lyle stockings for the dance in the church hall. Washed my hair with coconut oil shampoo and then Amami chamomile golden hair rinse. Set it in curlers with Lightia setting lotion and put on Pond's face powder and orange tangy lipstick. Then I smoothed Amami golden scented hair oil over my hair to give an extra shine, gleaming golden lights. I was ready dressed in my lemon net party dress when Tani called. She had a blue tat taffeta dress on and her hair is always pretty. She had sewn two bits of cotton wool onto her brassiere to give her a better shape. I didn't bother, but perhaps I should have. Unfortunately, when we got to the dance and she took her coat off, one of the cotton wool balls had come off, so she looked a bit odd. We searched everywhere for it, and luckily I had a spare hanky, so we pinned that on to try and balance. We had to do this in the small nav in case someone saw us. It was very hot in there, and when I looked in the mirror in the cloakroom, my powder had caked. So it was all very stressful. The rector asked me to dance. I told him I couldn't, actually he couldn't either. We just jigged around, his stomach was so big and he holds you so tight, it's like being on a rough sea. 
jigging up and down. Every time we passed Evelyn, Eileen and the rest of the girls, they were laughing like mad. So not a very good experience. Um, this is um, another oil. It's called Sunday Children. And again, it shows the pits in the back, which aren't there, but it, it's just a reminder of where the community was. There were seven collieries around Astragunas, and yet it had the woods and the beacons quite close. These children are Sunday afternoon, their fathers are probably sleeping, catching up with sleep after the week. And this is Oddfellow Street. This is uh, shop Lisa Mikel. And um, this shop, I think somebody will remind me, I think who's listening. Uh, I think it's got the um, pop factory next to it that Joseph Herman turned into a home and studio in 1944. But it was an amazing shop. It had everything you could possibly wish for in, in, in the sweets and chocolate. And um, children are outside longing to get in. Uh, these, there were summer days, obviously, um, good days when uh, the colliers were on holiday and could relax. Again, there's the, the pit in the background. Betty did uh, quite a few um, based on uh, the colliery. Uh, there, there was a lovely one called um, the Pit Ponies which shows the ponies coming out for their week or two weeks rest from being underground in darkness for the rest of the months. And quite disturbing when the, the ostler took off the um, hood that they have over their eyes and they actually went a bit crazy, the horses, they just um, seeing the light dazzling them and it took quite a while for them to settle down and be calm. They were very well looked after by the um, people in the farm or keeping them on their land. And of course the children would take them to bits. The shop we saw earlier was, was uh, um, quite an organized shop. A lot of people were, I mean, the, the, it was po uh, poverty was rife and a lot of people would have a little shop in their front parlor, maybe with just four bottles of sweets um, to sell. There was also a trip to Windsor, uh, which I don't think we do these days, uh, a day trip. As you left Astragunas at seven in the morning on the train, which would take you down to Swansea where you'd change to the London train get to Windsor about 12.30, my mother says in her, uh, in her journal, um, have a picnic on the river and then a ride up to Runnymede and back for the eight o'clock train back to Swansea, arriving back in Astrid about midnight. This was the uh, monkey parade this is an oil again. The monkey parade, I think it, it happened in most South Wales valleys. Um, and I know it's happened in Yorkshire as well, that the girls and boys would line up on opposite sides of the road and walk. This, this happened here, particularly from a Slavera. Um, it, it couldn't be allowed in Astrakandas because uh, you wanted to get away from your parents anyway. So it happened in a Slavera next little village down. And um, they would walk from the capital cinema up the hill to the Empire Cinema. And this was the, um, the chance to meet somebody. If you cross the road, you were in luck. I don't think the three in the back are going to be catching, they're gonna be catching the bus home on their own. 
This is Betty, aged uh, 18, I think. She'd left school and she became um, assistant to her father in his photographic work, which was an all encompassing project after his teaching day. Um, this was um, the closest you actually got to the opposite sex was at the three weekly, three, three, yeah, three times a week um, dance, either in the Aslebera Church Hall or the Welfare Hall, uh, Astragunas Church Hall, dances were uh, all over the valley. And Betty at the Aslebera Church Hall met Howell, my father. He was the son of uh, Will Hopkin, who was proprietor of a newspaper that he'd set himself, the West Wales Observer. And Howell and the Hopkins lived down in Pontadawe. So the romance began. Howell was studying technical drawing um, with a view to becoming an architect. This is um, what happened then, of course, uh, 1939, was the war, um, Second World War, that's Blodwin, Llew, as, um and Betty, with Llew's hat on, being a fire warden. This is Howell's drawing of um, that he submitted a part of his application for the RIBA architectural course that he wanted to study, which he passed and qualified. He was about 20 when he did this drawing. This is Howlin Caldy. After he qualified, um, he worked as assistant architect at County Hall in Cardiff. Um, and of course, when, he, when war broke out, he um, signed up for the Navy, but sadly was told that his health deemed him C4 and therefore unable to serve. He'd suffered dramatic fever as a, as a child and that had left him with heart issues. He thought Betty would uh, also um, turn him down um, when he proposed, but uh, she didn't, and they married in 1940. In Cardiff, where they were living, um, Betty attended grammar school, um, attended Cardiff College of Education, and. Uh, was studying design and graphics, hoping to become an interior decorator um, for the houses, obviously, that Howell was hoping to design. Uh, but finding out she was uh, pregnant and with an anti-aircraft gun on the railway behind their rented rooms in Roth, um, they decided to come back to Astragunas, where um, the war was hardly happening. This is um, my mother with my sister, Wendy. Howell found a position with private architects in Swansea, uh, Mercer and Vaughan. He did fire duty after work every evening and would often be caught in, on a bus on the way back in the blackout, sitting for hours, uh, waiting for the sirens to stop and the raid to stop. Um, right, at home now, um, Betty took up sketching and drawing and painting again. Uh, this is our garden in Astrid, which I can say was a paradise for me growing up in Astragalus. This is, uh, was a common sight when women would sit out uh, on their windowsills and um, pull down the sash window to keep them safe from falling and clean the windows. My mother had to do her cleaning 
uh, of course, at the front. Everybody cleaned their front. Uh, but she had to do it in a hurry because everyone would stop and talk. Mrs. Evans, Portha Bryn, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Ben Griff, Winnie Lodwick, Mrs. Griffith's chip shop, and Mrs. Davis next to Arvonia, dressed to kill, or Mrs. Prosser across the road. Um, so it all had to be done because everyone wanted to talk. It was that kind of community. This is the miners' bus, which um, appeared, I think, in the 20s, so that miners didn't have to walk anymore to the, to the colliery. They had a bus to bring them back to Ostrogundus to the cross. This is Mr. Morgan the Bread. The Valley Bus, uh, Betty became, this is from a photograph of my grandfather's. Um, I think near Patleg, which is uh, where the, the road gets very narrow uh, between Aslabera and Pontadawe. She did quite a few valley buses in greys and uh, and reds. And uh, there's a, an advert there for the um, Palais de Danse in Pointe d'Aue, which you could only go to if you had a car to take you down there. And it cost one and six anyway. So it was a very infrequent event. This is uh, one of the sunny wash days. and stormy wash day. Um, this is um, quite an evocative day. It's, it's those days, we, we call it Glauman, which is fine rain, but this is actually a storm where the rain seems to be coming from all directions. Because I did point out to Betty that the clothes were going blowing to the right and the tree was blown to the left. And she said, well, that's what it felt like. So to just the, the feeling that you're being assaulted on, on both sides. This is uh, again from one of Klaus' photographs, I think. It's the last shift at a Slavera colliery. another mining. This is uh, 1944 and Betty met um, Joseph Herman, the refugee artist who was seeking a home for uh, himself and his wife, who was then expecting a baby, Catriona, um, away from the horror of wartime London. He was used to us, he was introduced to Astragunlas and my family by our friends Peg and David Alexander. Joseph became a regular visitor at Merton, enjoying my grandmother's cooking. And uh, Slough's talk of art, of course, when they went. Uh, walking the hills in the evenings. This is the gift that uh, Joseph gave to Llew. It is signed to Llew in friendship. And it is of golf buildings where Joseph lived um, with Catriona in the studio on the right hand side there. Again, he does, uh, I think what Betty always did Put, put the tip there. There was, there is no tip there, but it is a bit further over to the right, so it's artistic license. Joe said, Joe did find great comfort in Astragunlas coming from the ghetto in Warsaw. Um, I remember him telling me that he watched one day. He was sketching and watched a man calling at every house in the street and wondered why. 
that he was watching and um, the man would be invited in or would have arms put around him or they'd be as if they were commiserating. And later that evening, he found out that the man had that day heard that his son had been killed in action and um, was just telling everybody in the village because they were part of the, of the family. This is one Betty did of Joe sketching the miners who were squatting outside um, Santi's, the Italian um, cafe. Um, it was a great draw, the cafe. I wish somebody would bring back the Italian cafes so open until very late at night and even open on Sundays uh, when Mr. Santi would have to go to court um, and pay his dues on the Monday for opening on a Sunday, which was illegal. But paying the five pounds um, on the Monday, he probably made much more on the Sunday. His excuse was that he could not refuse the miners their tobacco and the children their sweets. This is Joe outside the Astoria cinema. He loved the cinema, uh, but he would not queue. I think that might have something to do with growing up in uh, with the anti-Semitism in Warsaw during the 20s and 30s and having to queue for bread uh, and most things. Um, so Blodwen would wait in the bay window opposite the cinema uh, and tell him when the queue had almost gone in and it was safe for him to join it. Betty had little time for painting during the 50s and 60s, but she did write children's stories and plays for the local amateur dramatic society. Uh, when Wendy and I left for college, that's when she really started to paint in response to me asking her to illustrate what life was like in the 20s and 30s and 40s. This is 1936, and it's the coronation of George VI um, in Oddfellow Street again. Although the miners were staunch labor, there was huge um, respect for the royal family. Um, this is after the abdication, of course, of Edward VIII, the Prince of Wales, who had been very, very popular in Wales. Um, and my grandmother said, why couldn't he have married a very nice English girl instead of the Americans uh, um, who had been married about three or four times by the time the, the gossip got round. But George VI uh, was crowned and this is the street party with some of the windows open to listen to the broadcast from Westminster Abbey. I haven't counted, or I think I have counted the figures in this and there are about just over a hundred. This is Betty's grandfather's funeral, Dad Key's funeral. And this is the house here, Sunny Hill, facing Cambrian Terrace. All the curtains of Cambrian Terrace are closed in respect, uh, except for one little face peeping out there, I can see. The choir would turn up at an important funeral. And of course, there'd be a lot of singing of the hymns, notably Kumranda. At the back, there are three or four women. I don't know if you can see them, but they were not known to the family. They're not part of the family. Women didn't go to funerals, uh, but they are, uh, they used to turn up at various funerals and um, weep and um, have their handkerchiefs to their faces. So I think they were called professional funeral goers. I think the same thing happens in Russia. I haven't heard of it anywhere else. Uh, I'll go back to this one because it was in the early 70s that 
Betty took this and uh, a few of the ones you've seen, the coronation definitely, up to, um, in a carrier bag, up to London uh, to show to a gallery. Now, the only gallery she knew um, with any um, great knowledge was the Cork Street Gallery of Roland Browse and Del Banco, which had been Joseph's Gallery and was still Joseph's Gallery from the 40s to the 70s. And she'd met Dr. Roland, one of the owners, um, when he'd come down to Astragunas with Joseph and Joe had brought him over to Merton. So she walked in and uh, realized immediately seeing the paintings on the wall that it wasn't the gallery for her work. But uh, one of the owners, I'm not sure which one, pointed her across the road to the portal gallery, which specialized in naive and primitive work. When uh, she phoned me that night, I was living in London, she phoned and uh, she told me what she'd done. I said, well, did they like them? And she said, well, they didn't say very much, but they want me to do 30 for an exhibition. So I thought that's pretty good. Eric Lister uh, was a wonderful character and he was one of the owners of the portal. And he just loved Betty's um, imaginative use of um, her subject matter. Show me your childhood is what he said. Show me your childhood. Um, and her work appears in two of his books, one 20th century British naive and primitive artists, which is published in England, and British primitive fantasists, which was published in America. This is what he said about her work. Um, the miners carnivals, the chip shop, the sweet shop, weddings, all painted with great care, are a unique chronicle of life within the small Welsh village community, seen through the eyes of a child, but executed with the formal composition of an adult. Her imaginative colours and oversized figures give her work an innocent charm. Eric uh, would make up annual themes for his uh, stable of artists. And this is one of them. Adam and Eve um, was the title of the theme, but Betty has brought the Garden of Eden to the Welsh Valleys and um, placed Adam and Eve there on the left um, with the industrial terraced cottages uh, on the right. This is another theme. Uh, this is um, St. George and the Dragon. And again, he's uh, going to be seduced by this um, blonde Welsh beauty, but she's brought along the dragon. In the far distance, there are coal tips, I think, yes but it's outside the pub and it's obvious that uh, St. George doesn't have a chance. Um, there were other uh, religious subjects, if I can remember, Daniel in the lion's den and Jonah and the whale. Um, this is... Um, the Romanese arriving in Astragunas to sell their pegs and laces and to tell fortunes. Well, quite an exciting day that. Again, the Tabernacle Chapel in the distance and the call tips. Betty was, um, yes, very imaginative. She would make up uh, characters that she wanted to paint about. I don't know if they were based on actual people in Astragunas. They might be. Um, this is Di Romantic, who decided to paint his house pink, uh, covered in flowers, to the astonishment of the neighbours. 
and uh, the envy actually of the women in the street who thought it was very romantic. Di also, uh, while the men are walking to work, Di will stop and pick a rose for his wife. Betty wasn't, um, although she was, um, wanted to celebrate the best uh, of Ostrogunda's life and, and to bring the joy out, uh, that was there. She was very aware of the poverty and the TB that was rife and uh, noted in her diary here in 1936, um, one of the uh, stay in strikes, which meant that when the colliers were in work for the 10 hours, they did not come up. They stayed underground and were on strike. So this is 10th of January, 1936. The collier strike at Sked is still on. Mammy made six loaves of East cake and took them up to Mangi's house where the aunties were making sandwiches and Mangi was putting them into tins. Mammy and the aunties and I carried all the food up to the colliery. There was a crowd there and a lot of angry talking going on. Didan, the miner's agent, and Mr. Davis, the manager, were arguing the toss whether or not the food should be allowed to go down to the men. The crowd then joined in and Mr. Davis was actually called a murderer. He then agreed that the food be, be sent down and we all cheered. As we walked back to the main road, it began to snow and I pointed out a snowdrop to Mammy. It was the first snowdrop of the year and partly hidden under a clump of black coal. I tried to dust its petals, but Mammy said no more. More dust will come, of course. Everyone hopes the strike at Sked will be over by tomorrow. Mangi looks very worried because Uncle Di and Uncle Tom are down there underground where there is always danger. This is another invented, uh, partly based, I think, on, on a character in Astragandas, who became obsessed with outer space and trying to find the end of space, which he was convinced was there. His name was Dan Stars. My mother called him anyway, but he had a very ineffectual um, telescope, not being able to afford a better one. Um, and he gave up billiards at the welfare and searched every night for that end of space that he was convinced was there. This is um, Sailor's Bouquet, now that she did for the portal. Um, Obviously, sailor's bouquet, fish, yes. But great detail. This is um, called The Card Players and is her memory of her uncle's pub, the Jeff. And uh, not that women went in, they had to go to the back door if you wanted uh, a pint of stout, if somebody wasn't well in the, in, the, in the house, the stout was full of vitamin Bs and uh, iron, but uh, never went into the pub. Those are the card players. This is uh, out to play. Off to market, this is actually uh, the Gwyn Arms on the left there, which is on the way to Brecon. And it's Mrs. Price the Gwyn on the left and my grandmother on the right, taking um, their wares, be it jams or preserved uh, fruits uh, up to the market in Brecon. This is another oil, um, memories of girl guides camping. 
these are all later works. Tom Mashler uh, was the one who went to the one of her exhibitions at the portal. Um, he was head of Jonathan Cape and he was the one who encouraged her to write stories around her paintings. And so emerged her two books, uh, Then the Siren Sounded and Butterflies of the Valley. This is another for uh, themed painting, Noah's Ark. Um, it looks like Upper Iron in West Wales, but it's actually, uh, there's the Mumbles Lighthouse in the background. Um, and instead of animals going on to the ark, it's uh, Betty decided the children would go on two by two. And these, I think, are all painted as twins. After Eric Lister's death, um, I found the Lucy B. Campbell Gallery in London, in Kensington, uh, which specialized in naive and folk art, uh, mostly American artists, but Betty sold quite well there. By now, she was also exhibiting at the Albany Gallery in Cardiff. This is Minor with Lamp. Mam Gee's knitting class. That's an oil. And a rare uh, floral. Waiting for summer. And uh, this uh, quite an audacious woman is called a Merry Widow. Um, again, she might be loosely based on somebody in Astragunas uh, who um, grew, drew gasps of um, disgust from the women when she appeared at her husband's funeral in dressed in red with red lipstick, red hat. And here she's sitting in the wake um, with the Swansea china on the table, the two gentlemen in the back, probably discussing which one should stay for a, a final sherry, while in the doorway are the ghostly memories of her mother and grandmother, probably telling her, trying to remind her how to behave properly. There was an exhibition in Los Angeles during the 70s at the Fowler Mills Gallery um, at the instigation of, of the portal. And that went very well as well. She sold out um, 30 paintings in her first exhibition at the portal. This is another oil. It's um, Sunday on the canal and it's gained Remembering Courting Days and a boat on the canal. There was a brief um, phase of 20s and 30s memories. It's called Chartreuse. It's an oil crayon. And Party Girl. These are later works, all hinting back to the 20s and 30s. But towards the end, there was a return to her beginnings in Astragunas. This is Gears Road and the river, Teddy Bear Bridge. Um, this is the last painting she did, aged 95. Um, In her writings, of course, she describes the simplicity of life and the warmth and the security in a truly caring community where aunties and uncles were called so, but though not necessarily blood relations, uh, where neighbors were all family and you made your own entertainment from 
sitting with her auntie Annie, reading Peg's papers, which was a magazine that Claire would not allow in the house. Um, and the only sound of the fire with the, was the fire crackling and Auntie Annie's knitting needles, to playing word games and walking every evening around the village. Everybody went out in the evenings after homework. Everybody was out exchanging gossip, meeting new people, and um, ending up probably in uh, Santi's with the Novelteine or the Temperance Cafe for the best ice cream in the world. We'll end with uh, this one, which was bought by UNICEF uh, for a greeting card. This is um, after the watch night service at St. Canogs. Um, everybody would meet on the cross in Astrid to dance to Mr. White's silver band. If it was 1945, there was great jubilation because the colliery hooters would go off. A huge change from the sirens that had been blowing for the last six years of war. And possibly Catriona MacLeod, Joseph's wife, dancing the Highland Fling here. Betty was extremely proud of her heritage in this significant Welsh village and always grateful for her rich and eventful life. Thank you. Dear from Valwood, Carol, that was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> and to see such a selection of work. It's lovely to know a lot of sense of humour as well in Betty's work, isn't there? Mm. Especially with um, some of the characters. We do have a, a couple of questions. We have a question here from Pete Bryan. Oh, right, yes. His question is, did Betty always paint from memory? Yes, I think she did. Um, there were photographs that, that Cleo had, obviously, of, of you know the coronation party. Um, but yes, things like the Takis funeral, which was... Um, it, it was her memory that was very, very vivid um, about the house because the Sunny Hill was taken down in the ooh, 70s, I think, uh, or possibly later. But yes, it was mostly memory and quite um, a joyful memory, really, of, of, uh, of, of the times. Um, her colours were very emotional. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't chosen to be. It. It was. Um, yeah. It was more emotional than rational. My father would always say, as an architect, my father would say that man will never get into that door. <laughs> and she said that's not important. He was the. Um, he was the policeman, so you know he's going to be bigger than. And this was the thing, partly to do with the community that everybody was the same um had the same problems the same difficulties and the only probably people who were most important in the village was the doctor the policeman and perhaps the teacher so yes you come from such a creative family carol you all have such talent where does it come from i think um well I'm not sure, really, because I, I think you, you can go back to your grandparents um, as influences. Uh, everybody can go back to their grandparents as influences. But, um, you know, Claire was, you know, if we'd be sitting at tea time, he'd say, come out, come out, um, come and look at the sunset, come and look at this and that. And he'd been taught by his mother every flower, all the flora and fauna of, of the surrounding hillsides. So he passed that on. And it's just that, I think it's observing. If you can teach children to observe, not just to look, but to observe um, and see uh, and, and discriminate, you know, and, and learn about colors and flavors and um, very, um, I suppose it was a sensuality there in, in 
growing up that perhaps is lost today because we rely so much on screens and that actual um, physical um, communion with nature isn't, isn't as vivid as it was. No, I think we just do what we want to do and, and express it. Oh, that's wonderful. We've got a few, um, few questions coming in here. From Anthea Davis. Wonderful talk, Carol. So many paintings I've never saw. Absolutely fascinating. Betty Watkins. I would like to remind you, Carol, that you have dramatised part of Betty's journal. Yeah. Dr dramatised? Dramatised. Um, I just read it out. It's here in my hand, 1936. Um, so it's, um, it covers the whole year uh, in quite detail. And um, it was, you know, it, it's, nothing is made up in it. It's not like a diary. It's, it's, it's actual facts um, about school days, especially. And um, that, that closeness that I, that I spoke about earlier, really, that uh, very, very difficult to explain these days because um, we are all, um, you know, I can walk around Ponte Tower at night and not see one person. But when I was growing up here, because it was a, um, a tin plate um, industrial village, everybody was out at night and uh, walking around and meeting people and talking and you know television was the death of that kind of life um, it's sad i wish it would come back we've got judith lovering mm. really enjoyable carol lovely stories and memories of your mother and the times she lived through i love her work judith thank you that's lovely pete again what a wonderful presentation carol Betty's paintings are marvellous and I really enjoyed seeing a selection of them. Are any of these in any of the more local muse museums? Local museums? No, I don't think so. A lot of them are still at home, um, you know, where I've built up the archive here. But um, no, I don't think there are. There might be quite soon, but we, we don't know. Nothing definite yet. Anthea Davis, have most of these paintings been sold or are there still some around? And did she date her paintings? Could she? Did she date her work? Date. Um, date of the paintings. Did she generally date her paintings? Oh, Smoke. date her paintings, sorry. Um, no, I don't think, oh, they're all signed, but not, not dated. And I should have explained at the beginning that I was giving them in the order that they illustrated her life and not in the order that they were done. Because it is the times of, of you know, I'm showing the times as well. And because this is what she did, she celebrated her life from the beginning, um, so they're not dated. And um, yes, there are quite a lot for um, still for sale um, here, you know, in the house. But um, she just wanted to get them out. You know, the, the best thing was for people to see them and um, enjoy them um, because that generation have a, have a, a experiences that they share, obviously, um, that people would have had the same experiences going to dances and meeting their husbands to be and and the romance of the cinema. Um, that was that was such an important part of her life. Um, so it's uh, yes, no, I don't think uh, uh, no, they're not dated, no. It's good to see this, this. They're so accurate, aren't they? For you can sort of tell when they were, what period they were yes. painted. Yes. This sort of accurately depicted, but even with the monkey parade, this it's so good to have such a um, a cultural um, 
item from the sort of early, early to mid 20th century, sort of Welsh cultural teen activity yes. mortalised in, in, in a painting, because most of the time it's something that people sort of talk about that happened in the past. Yes. The monkey parade. My grandmother used to talk about it happening in Morriston. So it's really she, interesting. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, Betty wasn't, she wasn't a portrait artist, she wasn't a landscape artist, but I think she was a social artist. And I think any painting where you portray people is a social painting, because then you, you look at what they've got on, you look at what they're doing. Um, this is what Joseph Herman said, you know, I, I, I'm interested in what people do, and this is what I paint. Um, you know, how people spend their lives. Um, so there was a, a great connection there with Joseph um, when he was in Estragonus, yes. We've got a question from Mary Pierce. It has been wonderful to see Betty's work. There are many echoes of how things were in the area I grew up in. Oh, that's good, yes, yes. I think it's um, it's a style that was uh is beginning to become recognized um more in in wales um because we don't have a tradition we have a tradition great tradition of landscape artists and and um portrait artists not many um social artists um unless you're talking about the mining community because there are lots of artists who do, who portray the mining community um, but on the social side, the lighter side, um, there aren't many, no. But um, a lot of her, those th 30 paintings that first sold um, went to America because I think there's much more uh, tradition there of naive and folk art uh, with Grandma Moses and, and people. Um, so, uh, yes, they... A lot went to America. We've got one last question from Anthea Davis. Did she photograph all her work? Would be she... a shame if not all were documented? Sorry, what was the question? Did she photograph all her work? Oh, no, we were very slow, very slow. I have got very poor paintings of my mother standing in, the, in Bond Street with the painting and it... <laughs> She could see the top of her head. Um, we just weren't thinking about, you know, recording things in the 70s. Um, it's a shame um, because a lot of them, like the Welsh weddings uh, and uh, a few that I, the trip was wonderful. It was on, um, it was the trip was uh, when the miners had saved all year long to uh, take the, um, Actually, they couldn't afford to go. It was the family that went, the mothers and the children went on the annual trip, usually to Puthkor or Gower. And uh, those have gone. Actually, they're, they're in um, Eric Lister's books, so that's not too bad. Um, but we, we did lose a lot. Mm, sad. We've got one last question, because I know time is coming up. From Rissian Pengilly. Wonderful presentation, Carol. Oh. Diolch, love Elizabeth's work, so evocative of the local community and the memories we have of life in the Swansea Valley. I would love to see more. Will there be a local exhibition in the future? Mm. <laughs> That's a good idea, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um... There could be, yes, easily. Um, it would probably be um, a lot of prints, um, which we were able to get, obviously, and, and make prints of. Um, so that's an idea, yes, that would be lovely. Especially in the welfare, where she went dancing every week. <laughs> oh, come on, Jen. Yes. One last question from Pete Bryan. Do you know, do you know how many paintings did she sell in her lifetime? Oh gosh, um, I've probably shown you about a third of her work because she started painting um, in the late 60s 
um, and did her last painting when she was 95. But obviously there were a lot of um, times when um, uh, she wasn't working. Uh, probably a third I've, sh I've shown today um, of her output. And I would say she sold hundreds really, 150, 200 more perhaps. Um, but as I say, the, the, the portal was, was the place where she started and it was the place where most of the paintings went. Um, because, you know, we call it naive art, but actually it's quite sophisticated <clears throat> in its um, expression. It's not um, naive in the way a child would work. It's naive in the, in the vision and the execution is quite uh, adult and um, quite complicated actually. Um, and although she was self-taught, you know, she didn't actually learn to paint professionally through a, an art college course or anything. So she learned as she went along. So in that case, she was a true um, naive artist. Yeah. It'd be good to know if um, who were her influences. Um, difficult. I don't think I don't think she had any really. Um, she had this mind that was um, uh, saw things very clearly in her head. And I, I did mention that she used a bit of a few of Claire's photographs as her inspiration. Uh, but no, because, I mean, she met Joseph and Joseph could have become, you know, a huge influence uh, on her work, but he, he didn't. Um, it wasn't the kind of work she wanted to do, no. There are a few of minors, obviously, but um, it is more that social side she wanted to do. Uh, he did take my sister, Wendy, out sketching in Ostrogunnus. And uh, she did a beautiful um, little oil painting, which I've got here. Um, my mother said, well, it's better than yours, Joe. And he said, well, it is, yes, actually it was. And uh, he, was, he was a good teacher, Joseph. But no, uh, that influence hasn't come through. It's just, she's just expressing what's in her head. And, um, you know, without... Uh, I think that's why the, the lack of formal training uh, comes through, because it isn't as people think it should be. Um, it's, it's Betty, and that's it. It's so inspirational <laughs> that she continued to work up until into her mid-90s. Mm. She was, um, you know, towards the end, then uh, she, you know, she'd get tired and she said, well, this is a, a boring day, no painting, no writing. And that's exactly what Klaus said at the end of his life. Another humdrum days in his diary uh, when he couldn't go out and walk the hills and do his photography. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Carol. That was extraordinary. Thank you, I enjoyed it. To learn more about Betty's life and work. And yeah, it would be fantastic to, to see an exhibition of her work in the near future in the Estragon Lice area. That would be good. Good. Thank you, everybody, for attending this evening. And this talk will also be available to watch again on YouTube. And I think it's gone out on Facebook Live. But um, it will be available again for you to watch. So thank you, Paup. Dear Carol. Thank you, Catherine. Till tomorrow. Quality can be here. Bye. Bye.